it's uh, it was tough to teach a class in this when there was another class in the same room, especially when you had like three boats going at the same time. You know, it was unfortunate to have to share that space <laughs> with knitters or something. I think it's important to be really into what you're doing, whatever you're going to teach. You got to be interested in it. You have to, and, and it's important to be generous with the information and and to to try to to try to offer as much as information as, as you possibly can. And it's also important to find out why your student is interested in this. What, you know, what's the intent here? Why why is this so important? Um, and and what do you want to get out of it? You know. Um, North House got started, I had a lot of people who wanted to apprentice with me. And so I taught a couple of classes at the, at the community ed in Grand Marais. During the, the last class I taught there, the Forest Service moved to the top of the hill. And they were wondering what to do with those, with those buildings. Pretty nice property down there, right on the lakefront and whatnot. And they, they gave North House the nod on that property. You know, the first summer was, it worked. People came, people, people started getting real interested in what was going on. So uh, when, I was, when I was first had this idea of a folk school, I, I talked to a lot of people um, that, that knew something about folk schools. And what I heard over and over again from, from these people was, um, uh, it, uh, well, what's your story? What is your story? I was always busy working with my hands as a kid. I was always doing something that was, that was um, involved making things. There's something really pleasurable about a nice sharp blade going through wood. Got a nice sound to it, sort of a nice texture to the sound. I mean, my father was a Norwegian Lutheran pastor and they didn't make any money back in those days. I think the family motto was, um, why buy when you can make? My mom made like 700 sweaters in her life. She was always knitting. And um, my dad had tools. He made bird feeders. The Cardinal Bird Feeder Company was uh, a way to make some extra money. So he had tools and I was free to use the tools and so I would, I would make things. Um, yeah, this is, a, this is a, a, a little Viking ship I made in the fourth grade because I was really interested in the Vikings. Very proud of the Norwegian heritage. <laughs> I didn't get too much detail on the dragon heads, but oh well, I guess this was good enough. Oh yeah, and I had there was a little side-mounted rudder that's that's gone missing. So yeah, it's like Vikings, you know, our ancestors. Big deal. Could better make a Viking ship, huh? <laughs> That's kind of how I got started in, in, in building and then just continued with it because I was having success and fun with it and I could get lost in it. And I you know, started making all kinds of different stuff, boats and saunas and stilts. It's a little serving tray. And, and then skis. Um, that's another thing that I've, I've made quite a few skis. People make skis, they're on a mission from God. I learned how to make skis from Marvin Sela, who was a, a, a fellow whose father was a master ski maker in um, Finland. That's pretty close, to the other side. I would stay in his sauna and spend evenings with him making skis. And you know, you can make them just out of a, a small six inch tree, you can cut that down, you can make Two skis, you just have to make sure that one ski is on the west side of the tree and the other one's on the east side of the tree because they get the same amount of sunlight. You make one, the one side's south and one side's north, well the north side doesn't get as much sunlight so that grain is different. And so there's, there's a lot to it. And then I started teaching that and enjoyed it, had just a great time. Danny, who made that one? Did you make that? No, this is the one from, uh, was it four years ago? 
Okay. That Lindy and Nate and Ian all built. That's right. Yeah. Sweet. I, I think the first the first boat I made was in f uh, between fourth and fifth grade. I think it was a little punt that I got the the lines for out of Popular Mechanics magazine. They always have plans that you could get. You know, you get it in the library and. It, draw that out and measure it up and make a little model and make a little model out of cardboard or something and then so you can go, okay, I know what I need now. And then this is a six hour canoe. Boy, we made a whole bunch of those with kids. It's, it's sold as a six hour canoe. I suppose if you really put your mind to it, you could make it in six hours. Yeah. I like building work boats whether it's a canoe or a kayak. The boats that are, are work boats are built to get you home. I've gone to Norway and Greenland where I've studied the, the construction of kayaks and lap strike boats of Norway. Oh gosh, yeah, there's all kinds of little things you can pick up. Over there, they soak all their lumber in salt water. It's a way to pickle the lumber. Making, making pine tar is definitely an invention of the Vikings. Well, this Norse pram is, um, is an invention of the, of, the, of the Vikings, and it's a, a very special design. It's known as the floating wheelbarrow. This is an extremely uh, stable boat. I mean, you see a boat like this way out in the North Sea. It was used for picking nets, um, uh, hauling a goat, or, uh, or they can make them larger, uh, uh, walk a cow in there, because by the time this thing actually hits the shore, there's a third of the boat that's hanging over the water line of the shoreline rather. And so it's just an easy step off the boat. And it sails well and it's, it's, it's safe. It's, it's gonna be good as I go into my older age. So this will be steamed here. It will drop into place already bent. Pre-bent before it and dried and so it'll go right in. Maybe just touch touch it up here and there. Well so that's my son Dan and that's Wendy. That's my wife. My wife and son. Yeah. My son has a spinal muscle atrophy. But um it was um um you know the saddest day of my life when I heard about his diagnosis, I remember, you know, your whole world falls apart. And somehow you get through it. The shop was sort of like a, a sanctuary for me where I could just work and get lost in what I was doing, but it's my therapy as well, so. Oh, here's the book. I autographed this one. There's Daniel's van that I fitted out. It's brought us all closer, and uh, we're over there every day uh, helping him. And that's not always like you plan, but you know, it, we you you just bungle along. <laughs> yeah, we don't know how long my son's gonna live. When you ask him, he'd say, "Well, I'm still here." He doesn't want to go. He's not ready to go. Um, that's his boat, and his ashes will be put in that. There'll be a lid that'll be put over the top of that, and that's where his ashes will lie. He, he's, he's way into the Viking Norse mythology and all that stuff, big time. And then, is that buried? Is that lit on fire and <laughs> thrown out into the, in the Lake Superior? I don't know. You're not supposed to put ashes in the Lake Superior anymore. DNR won't allow it. Interesting, huh? <laughs> known fun fact there. People say, well, where does the time go? Well, actually, I can tell you where the time goes. You know, I, you know, I made these doors, I made this shop, I made this, I, you know, and you just kind of, nice to know where your time goes. I mean, life is short, so. <laughs> I 
a lot of people come to North House realizing, well, maybe they're not going to be the president or maybe they're not going to be making gobs of money or whatever. Uh, and so they're looking at success in a different, little different way. People get sparked up when, when they see that they've made something. It's, it's, a, it's a tangible thing that they could feel really proud of, you know. And, and my job was to guide them through so it would be successful. It's the road to enlightenment, really. You have to awaken. You need to awaken before you can, you can find enlightenment. Postcards is made possible by the Minnesota Arts and Cultural Heritage Fund and the citizens of Minnesota. Additional support provided by Margaret A. Cargill Philanthropies. Mark and Margaret Yakel Juline on behalf of Shalom Hill Farms, a retreat and conference center in a prairie setting near Wyndham, Minnesota. On the web at shalomhillfarm.org. Alexandria, Minnesota, a year-round destination with hundreds of lakes, trails, and attractions for memorable vacations and events. More information at explorealex.com. The Lake Region Arts Council's Arts Calendar, an arts and cultural heritage funded digital calendar showcasing upcoming art events and opportunities for artists in West Central Minnesota. On the web at lrac4calendar.org. Playing today's new music plus your favorite hits, 96.7 Cram. Online at 96.7cram.com. <laughs>